You know, in a perfect society, everyone would have equal access to food, shelter, and every other form of basic resource necessary, not only for survival, but for living a good quality life. In a truly realized utopia, there would be not the smallest hint of racism, sexism, and every other form of discrimination and oppression. And at the very core of this utopian imagining of the world would be, well, communism. Or at least it would be if history had not, from time to time again, proved communism to be rather rather incapable in his quest for realizing an advanced and absolute egalitarian society. While communism has evolved to be a particularly complex, convoluted, and nuanced concept, both of economy and politics, almost everybody who has heard of the word has a basic, a bit simple understanding of the kind of society it imagines. Simply put, communism pushes for a world governed by absolute egalitarianism more than anything else. Communism aims to enable a global society where every member has equal access to the fruits and the benefits derived from labor. Communism, most recognizably, ends in social, political, and economical equality realized through the elimination of, well, private property. And communism is the sworn enemy of capitalism. Built on the cornerstone of social equality, communism since its inception has always been an attractive alternative to the predominantly capitalist mode of society that is embedded in most of the modern world. But if communism was such a noble idea, then why hasn't it replace capitalism as the dominant force that drives global economy? And can it ever, in fact, replace capitalism in this regard? If, in theory, communism was all about egalitarianism, then why in practice has it yielded only unstable dictatorial governments? Governments that have bestowed absolute material wealth to the rulers and crushing poverty to the masses. To arrive at answers to these questions, it is imperative that we not only define communism, but take a focused look into every nook and cranny of its crumpling establishment. And as with most things with a long complicated history, the best place to start is where it all began. London, 1848, with the publication of the quintessential Marxist text, The Communist Manifesto. Modern communism, as we understand it today, is deeply rooted in another left-wing economic school of thought, socialism. Socialism was already set in place for more than a few decades when German philosophers Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels put forth their economic disclosure in The Communist Manifesto. The very body of work that most academics believe gave rise to modern communism. For the most part, communist discourse was heavily derived from socialism. The communist agenda for a classless society, an egalitarian access to wealth, sustained unity among the working class, better working conditions, and a common ownership of resources, among many others, traced their roots back to socialist ideas. It was also socialism that first advocated for the state to take sole and absolute control of the forces and means of production and distribution in the society. But the biggest difference between the two left-wing schools lies in the manner in which they operate. Socialism was designed to operate within the existing democratic structure of a capitalist society. Communism, on the other hand, was designed to specifically overthrow through a violent revolution existing democratic and capitalist structures. Communism was designed to redistribute wealth to allow the poor and the working class equal social and financial rights long enjoyed by the middle class and the land-owning elite. This redistribution of wealth is ultimately achieved by relinquishing control of the means of production to the state. This basically means that in a communist society, nobody can own any business. It means that nobody can produce anything that can be sold for profit because the state owns every means of production and is in charge of its distribution. According to Frederick Engels and Principles of Communism, a fully realized communist utopia can only be achieved on the principle that a unified communist system governs every single country and every single society in the world. Historically, however, countries that were early adopters of communism have produced governments and societies that were less than utopic. Now let's get into a little bit about the Cold War. If history has any indication of its political tendencies, communism often sets itself as a cornerstone to totalitarian dictatorships. Understandably, the advocacy of communism that enables violent revolutions worldwide, along with its prominent history of authoritarianism, has made it a sworn enemy of the many countries who value a democratic government and free market society. This geopolitical tension between communist republics and democratic nations has in recent history given rise to the Cold War between the United States and the then USSR. It took five long decades, but it was the Cold War that ultimately ended the USSR in 1991. The Cold War started sometime in 1945, at the tail end of World War II. The Cold War was marked by the relative absence of any large-scale fighting between the two sides. It remained a top international concern, however, because both the USA and the USSR engaged in an 
unprecedented arms race. Both parties were developing at an alarming pace overkill retaliatory weapons that could easily result in mass destruction. As a result, both countries fully engaged in legitimate scare tactics that have kept each other in line. And this all ended in 1991 with the collapse of the USSR. Now let's get into a little bit about modern communism. It was discourses of Karl Marx in the Communist Manifesto that gave rise to modern communism. Hence, communism is often referred to as Marxism. Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto in 1848. At its very core, Marxist ideals are relatively simple. To free the poor from poverty by allowing the existence of a truly egalitarian society. The very means that Marx proposed to achieve these ends, however, was a different story. Simply put, Karl Marx believed that a true communist society should rise from the ashes of capitalism. In order to truly liberate the lower class from poverty, Marxism advocates for a violent revolution that will result in the total destruction of any existing systems besides communism. Following the hypothetical dismantling of capitalism, Marx would then push for a dictatorial takeover on the means of production in every segment of society. According to Marx, it is imperative that a dictatorial government gain absolute control over its citizens. Marx imagined an all-encompassing control that would allow the state to make personal decisions for its citizens. Marx's idea of state control extended to education and employment, religion and marriage, and virtually every personal choice that could potentially affect the society. This communist dictatorship, according to Marx, should also take charge in the collectivization of property and wealth. Marx believed that it is only after these prerequisites are met that the true communist utopia can be realized. Now, it is important to note that Karl Marx died before any of his theories can be proven in practice. While there were many nations that adopted a communist setup in the past, the utopia Marx envisioned has yet to be achieved. Much of the difficulty in realizing Marx's communist utopia lies in the violent global implementation that Marxism seeks to enforce because only by destroying every non-communist society will communism finally succeed in building a classless society. But it has become quite the irony, however, that the long-standing ideas of democracy and a free market economy, which Marxism seeks to overthrow from the very beginning, proved to be the defining force responsible in overthrowing Marxism in once communist countries. And it is a curious question, therefore, what are the weakest points in the communist establishment that ultimately allowed it to collapse upon itself? So here are five reasons why communism at the end of the day proved to be a really, really dumb, stupid idea. Number one, forced collectivization. Collectivization was an anti-private farming policy adopted by the USSR in an effort to facilitate the equitable distribution of agricultural produce, all while reducing the economic power of the kulaks or the prosperous proletariat. The forced collectivization law was most intensely pursued between 1928 and 1940, which coincided with Stalin's rise to power. Following Marxist doctrines, the USSR believed that forced collectivization would maximize the agricultural resources in the countryside. At the same time the collectivization law was pursued, Russian industry was taken off at an unbelievable pace, and great stores of food were necessary to feed the growing workforce. At the beginning of the 1930s, a vast majority of agricultural farms were forcibly enrolled in the collectivization program. This meant that all items produced on the farm were equally distributed among the population. Naturally, this policy was met by vicious masses of resisting landowners, most of whom were the small-time farmers who tilled their own lands. To counteract this resistance, Stalin swiftly sent out executioners to get rid of those who opposed the collectivization effort. This led to tens of millions of people who starved to death. The state's reacquisition of private farms was largely paid for by the working class, some tens of millions of whom famished to death in the first five years of forced collectivization. Chinese farmers were met with the same fate in the 1960s, which left 33 million people starving to their deaths. The forced collectivization in China was arguably the single worst famine in recent human history. Next, lack of basic human rights. Communism in theory is a philosophical imagining of a utopian society where citizens of the state are ultimately able to share resources and benefits according to need, where property serves as the common good for all, and where citizens engage in work motivated by personal desire rather than economic need. Communism in practice, however, has realized only authoritarian societies so far, where individual rights suffer for collective progress. Fundamental commonplace ideals like freedom of speech and artistic expression among others pose a great threat to a communist society. The blatant disregard for fundamental civil rights is at the very heart of the collapse of the Marxist governments in former communist states. The above mentioned forced collectivization policy, for example, is a dangerous practice in circumventing human rights. Number three, failure to adapt. Among the most prominent reasons why a Marxist setup of society tends to collapse upon itself is because of its 
inability to adapt to the changing conditions that exists outside of its prescribed reality. For instance, the fluctuation that occurs in a free market economy is a real world riddle that Marxism economists were unable to solve. A Marxist approach to understanding the market fails to take into account the market prices of commodities. Without access to the checks and balances of the prices of commodities, it was unable to properly distribute its national resources. Next, lack of creativity. A Marxist informed state by design values utilitarianism over anything else. Marxist utilitarianism basically means that for every action performed by a citizen, there must be a resulting contribution to the empowerment of the state. Communist nations have little to no use for artistic endeavors such as the writing of literature, sculpture, and painting among others. Needless to say, such thinking has allowed communist governments to violently undermine the individual aspirations of its citizens. Whatever work of art that is created in a communist society is only allowed to exist by the government to serve a singular purpose, and a singular purpose only, to hail the Communist Party. And on the other hand, artists who oppose the Communist Party are perceived as threats and are immediately eliminated. Finally, Marxism was a bad idea from the very start. A likely explanation to the failures of communism, both as an economic and political establishment, is that Karl Marx is basically a moron. Much of the economic philosophies of Marxism are deeply rooted in the labor theory of value. Simply put, the theory predicts that relative value of commodity based on the amount of labor that was needed for its production. It asserts that, for example, a car should cost more than a pair of sneakers simply because more labor was necessary in the production of a car than a pair of sneakers. While that equation might sound reasonable on the surface, it is too overly simplified. For example, let's take that iPhone you all have. There are other cell phones out there that pretty much match the performance in every single specification of the more popular iPhone, yet the iPhone retails for twice as much. I mean, the cost of materials and labor between the two phones are pretty similar, yet people gladly pay twice as much for an iPhone. The same is true for medicine and with almost every commodity in the market. Because the real world economy dictates that the price of a product is motivated by its supply and demand. But to Marx, he saw communism as the final evolution of social progression. He believed that the world was bound to evolve from primitive civilizations to masters and slave societies to feudal kingdoms to capitalist countries to socialist nations until eventually to a singular egalitarian communist utopia. But there exists a larger world outside Karl Marx's mind, a world that might not be a utopia in any shape or form, but a much real world nonetheless, peopled by those who live through real world abuses driven by political and economic inequality. And let's just take the real world examples. I mean, would you like to live in North Korea? Even in China, where it looks very successful and growing and modern from the surface, you still could be arrested for talking about Tibetan freedom or Taiwan independence or Falun Gong or even having a Bible study in your home. Anyway, I made this video because a lot of people were messaging me asking me to talk about communism. So hopefully you guys found this helpful. Thank you all so much for watching. See you later.